Good morning. My name is Prash, and I'm a, I'm a psychedelic psychiatrist. <laughs> While my main research interest, my intellectual interest is in psychedelics, um, it is psychiatry that does pay the bills. Um, and thankfully, I'm not the only one interested in that. Uh, mental illness is a, is a global problem. Um, it is the third leading cause of uh, global disease burden, and it's predicted that by 2020, depression alone will contribute um, to being the second largest cause of global disease burden. And with this increased awareness in mental health, um, technology um, has started to become interested. Um, everything from transcranial stimulation to deep brain stimulation to DNA genotyping, technology has started to impede or intrude into the way uh, we enhance therapeutics and mental health. But new developments or successful developments in mental health have been few and far between. It's interesting then that one of the most, one of the most exciting developments that have come up in the last sort of, 10 to 15 years has been a hark back to a medicine of old, um, that of psychedelics, these surreal, mystical substances with their, um, the, both the pedi laden with both the pedigree and the stigma uh, of history. Um, we will discuss today psychedelics, um, some of their historical significance, and um, go into some of the users, some of the users that I find quite interesting, um, and how they have made the transition from hippie fairy dust to hospital grade medicine, um, and even to tech world tonic, um, which is currently where we think of it as standing. Uh, we think of drugs commonly in a very simplistic model. We think of stimulants or depressants, uppers or downers. Um, but I'd like to broaden that perspective a little bit and include another separate axis, um, that of psychedelics and empathogens, um, because really no drug sits purely on a stimulant-depressant axis. Empathogens are so-called because of their ability to induce uh, empathy, uh, a sense of oneness with a common man, MDMA, some of you may become uh, familiar with, is probably one of the best examples of that. And then there are psychedelics, which are the primary um, purpose of the talk today. Um, we'll start by talking about some of the protagonists here. I won't go into it in too much detail, but you cannot talk about psychedelics without talking about uh, LSD uh, or acid. Um, LSD was first synthesized in 1938 in the Sandoz Laboratories in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, it was an agotamine derivative. It was synthesized as a respiratory stimulant, um, but it didn't really work. And then in 1943, Albert Hoffman, um, a scientist with Basel Laboratories, was experimenting with this substance, which he dug, dug out from the back rooms, um, and accidentally ingested, <laughs> that's a, accidentally, ingested <laughs> about 200 micrograms of this. Oh no, he accidentally ingested an unknown amount of this substance and then went home and found that funny things were happening, strangely enough. So three days later, on the 19th of April, 1943, uh, he, he uh, dosed himself with 200 micrograms of LSD, got on his bicycle and rode home, or attempted to ride home. That was the world's first ever intentional acid trip, and it is still celebrated today, every year, on the 19th of April, um, bicycle day. Um, it's probably the day where more people take acid um, in a year than any other, any other day in the year. Um, psilocybin, uh, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, um, that's the Amanita mascara. It's, it's probably the most attractive looking magic mushroom. Most of the, most of the rest look pretty crummy. Um, but like any of its other organic psychedelic uh, cousins, like mescaline, they have been used in religious sacraments for possibly as long as there ever has been religious sacrament and religious ceremony. And talking about religious ceremony, um, DMT, uh, possibly one of the most potent hallucinogenic substances known to man, uh, it's the active ingredient in ayahuasca, uh, which is the, well, the drug and the uh, shamanistic ritual of which hordes of tourists flock to the middle of the Amazon every year seeking. Um, the problem with these substances, uh, with psychedelics, is that we don't really know how they work. Um, with advanced technological advancements, so if we, if we have functional MRI studies which show which areas of the brain light up under the effect of these substances, we have complex neurotransmitter assays that show which biochemical pathways are implicated when these substances start to um, have their effect. But how that translates to the subjective effects of the user, we have absolutely no idea. We can prove association, but we have, we, we have absolutely no, no idea how to prove causality. And that is a, and that is a problem moving forward. Um, but we'll talk, seeing as I mentioned, 
the subjective effects, just briefly, uh, but the subjective effects of the psychedelic experience. I'm going to now try and explain to you the psychedelic trip, which, apart from being extremely self-revealing, is is also incredibly difficult because you're talking about a, phenom a phenomenological experience, um, and my attempts to describe it to you are going to be limited by my, this very blunt tool we call language. Um, but I think of it as having five main components. First and foremost, there are the hallucinations. Um, these are frequently visual or auditory, um, but can encompass all perceptual modalities. Um, the important thing to, that I would like to point out is that you don't actually see things that aren't there. It's not that you're seeing new things, just that you're seeing the things that are there in a new way. Um, it's a new way of visualizing the world around you. Um, next, there's an, a concept called synesthesia. synesthesia. Synesthesia is the idea of being able to perceive one perceptual stimulus in a completely different perceptual modality. So the idea of being able to see music or to taste the sound, um, which is... Uh, <laughs> Even as I try to explain it, I realize how strange that may be for someone who has never experienced that before. Um, a third component is a hypersensitivity or a hyperacuity percep to perceptual stimuli. So uh, being really finely attuned to the differences in, uh, between different uh, sound uh, wavelengths, for example, or uh, being able to differentiate between minute differences in texture or taste. Um, a fourth element is ego disillusion. We all walk around with a sort of narcissistic protective shell around us. It's what protects us from the insults of the world, um, but it also tends to make us pricks a lot of the time. Um, and under the effect of the psychedelic experience, there's, a, there's this idea of the ego disillusion, a breaking down of these narcissistic boundaries, um, a returning, this, returning one to a sort of sameness with even the most simple of beings out there. But perhaps the most cardinal core of the psychedelic experience is the existential awakening, um, this idea of being endowed with a knowledge, a wisdom, an understanding of a, of a concept or a paradigm that you, never were, you didn't even know existed before, you didn't even know could exist before. Sorry, I need to keep reminding myself. Um, we've moved on since then. I mean, that, uh, we've, used, we've started to use these, these subjective effects um, in, well, in recreational forms. Uh, and the problem with recreational drug use has always been, for most people, the idea that it never has been really structured. Um, most people's experience with, psych with, with, drug, with psychedelics or with any drug use really has been mostly sporadic um, and uh, very scattered. Oh, well, like Charlie who went to a festival and someone put some, something under his tongue and he took it. Or you went to a party and you, you had a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of this and a bit of that. But therapeutic, and sorry, don't get me wrong, I've got nothing against well-intentioned, safe recreational drug use, but therapeutic drug use is a completely different animal altogether. We're talking about using a specific substance with a specific aim due to uh, an understanding of its um, specific effects and potential to achieve that desired effect. Um, that is a different way of considering a drug altogether. And when it comes down to therapeutic drug use, one of the... One of the um, uh, well, one of its main users would be in psychotherapy, which is where I get interested. The idea of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy is not a newfangled phenomenon. Um, the, uh, the US government invested um, what at that time was millions of dollars, um, and about 117 different trials, I think, between the time between 1950 and 1970, with the CIA being particularly interested. Um, there were two main modes of therapy at the time. Um, there was psycholytic therapy, which involved we might have moved on slide-wise a bit. Um, psycholytic therapy, which involved taking very small doses of the drug and then entering a therapy session, the idea that the increased openness acted as a sort of catalytic gateway into the subconscious. Um, and then there was psychedelic, ther psychedelic therapy, which was taking large doses, uh, trip-sized doses of the drug, um, and because of the, the effects, you can't, couldn't really have a therapy session uh, at the time, but then having sessions of psychotherapy after to work through the learning that came from it. Um, that all stalled, unfortunately, in 1970, when Richard Nixon signed the Controlled Substances Act, uh, relegating psychedelics to becoming Class A drugs. Um, it was a problem. But we have seen a resurgence in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, um, and one of the, the, the two main angles where we're really seeing a resurgence is in therapist rooms and in Silicon Valley. Um, we've gone from it being psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy being purely a research tool to now uh, being quite prevalent in mainstream hospitals. This is some of the trials going on around the world. One of the, the, two, the two things I want to point out to you, the fact that it happens with uh, 
all over the world, but there's nothing here from Australia, which is a very sore point of contention for me, um, but that's a topic for another talk. I'll go through some of the studies quite quickly. Um, this is... Uh, this is one of the best uh, studies that I know running off right now. Um, it's at Johns Hopkins University and is using psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in mush mushrooms, to treat uh, end-of-life um, end uh, anxiety in patients with terminal illnesses. Um, medicine spends a lot of time, energy and resources into teaching us how to live better. Um, why not teach us how to die better? And what better patient population than those who are been confronted with the impending mortality and then having to live with that idea for an undifferentiated period of time. Um, another study, which is, could you please remind me? Oh, so this is what some of the therapy rooms look like um, with the Johns Hopkins study. Comfortable rooms, patients lying down, they're piped into music, two therapists to guide them. If you ignore the phallic object, ignore the phallic object in the background, it's all very calm and peaceful. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's supposed to be a mushroom. Um, so it's moving on. Another one of the studies, this is uh, into psilocybin in uh, treatment-resistant depression uh, at UCLA. Important thing to note, uh, based on depression scores versus at one week after therapy and at three months after therapy, showing that there was actually sustained improvement. The even better study is the one following up after this, uh, which is using MDMA for the treatment of PTSD um, in return war veterans at the University of Southern Carolina. Again, sustained improvement at up to three and a half years when you consider that PTSD is, is, is something that we really, really struggle to treat. We don't have any really good treatments out there. That is a pretty sensational development. Um, can I get to the next slide, please? While those are all structured trials, I'm sorry, Dan, I am coming to an end. While those are all structured trials, um, the psychedelic space has also great, seen a great increase in self-dosing, and particularly with microdosing, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, microdosing is the, is the idea of taking very small amounts of the drugs. We're talking about a tenth of what would be an average dose, a trip dose, and but taking it every morning and going about your daily routine, work, play, whatever that is, um, sort of like your, your morning coffee, or with your morning coffee, or in your morning coffee. Um, and interestingly, the, the idea behind this is that while you don't get the full gamut of the psychedelic experience, which makes functionality quite impossible, you still have some of the benefits of increased openness, increased creativity, better interpersonal relationships, and, and then that buzzword for everyone now, being in flow. Um, and one of, the, one of the early adopters now has been the tech industry, and particularly Silicon Valley. I don't want to talk too much about it, but that should say enough. Uh, and if any of you have Facebook, this has probably been loaded with these clickbait articles um, that relate to this at some point. Um, I'm hoping that this will become, that psychedelics will become to Silicon Valley what cocaine was to Wall Street. That will be a great day. Um, I'm going to leave you with this. Um, we are... We, have in the, we are in the midst of these substances with so much promise and so much potential to help and to heal. Um, we are hampered, though, uh, by legal restrictions, um, by historical stigma, um, by various other intangible obstructions um, that will take generations to change, not one, but many. Um, a good friend of mine is in New York right now at, the, at a blockchain conference, uh, and he sent me a message two days ago saying, um, 5,000 people here, each one buying and selling their own version of the future, which I thought was pretty poetic. I'm not here to sell you my version of the future, um, but I do hope that whatever my future looks like, um, that psychedelics will be part of it, um, and I hope you're part of yours too. Thank you. All right, thank you, Prash. This is going to be the best RBT after party ever. Um, just, an important message, um, and Prash did ask me to mention this. So when he's not um, working or working the speaking circuit, this is your fourth presentation this week? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, he's actively seeking your money or that of your philanthropic grandparents to help get psychedelic research off the ground in Australia. If you want to get involved, you come and chat with him. Um, or chat with James about how to support the industry in other ways. Um, but either way, do we have any questions for Prash? One up the front here. Yeah, it's a big problem. Um, and that's probably why... That, that <laughs> I, I, I end up sounding like a conspiracy theorist when I start, theorist when I start bringing up Big Pharma, and that because Big Pharma has no vested interest, um, that's, why, that's one of the reasons why things haven't gone along. Uh, if you consider a drug like ketamine, 
ketamine is a, it's not a traditional psychedelic, it's a dissociative, but it's, you can broadly put it under this, this, the larger um, psychedelic umbrella. Because ketamine has been used in medicine for so long as a local anesthetic, uh, well, sorry, as an anesthetic of some form, um, it has had a patent, patent attached to it, and therefore it is able to be manufactured and, people, and companies can profit from it. I think until we actually get to a point where it is recognized as a medicine first, that's the only way we're going to get to the to sort of patterns and then a commercial use. Um, the, it's a chicken and egg situation though. If we had pharmaceutical companies with the money pushing through this agenda, we're more likely to make it a medicine, but until we make it a medicine, pharmaceutical... <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I'll just repeat the question. So the question was, um, more information about side effects and impact of long-term use. Told you this would come up. I'm just going to try and pull up some statistics very quickly and pull up a slide hey, for you. Look at this. Bam. Oh, whoa. Oh. That, that is not a planted question. We just knew someone was going to ask. Oh, we just thought we didn't have enough time. Um, this is a study by Professor David Nutt, which is a very unfortunate name when you're a psychiatrist. Um, <laughs> but he's one of the world's leading drug researchers at uh, UCL in the UK. Uh, and he released the seminal study. He got fired from being the head of the uh, UK advisory body on drugs because he suggested then, uh, that uh, LSD and MDMA uh, was safer than horse riding, which is not something you say in the UK to the royal family. Um, but this study in 2010, one of the seminal studies into harm to self and harm to others, and you can see here, alcohol, number one, tobacco up there, in between you have heroin, crack and ice, in between them, uh, sandwiched by two legal drugs. Number 17 is cut, which is a root that the Ethiopians chew, and below that, 18, 19 and 20, are, um, those are, well, three of those four are Class A drugs. In terms of harm to self and harm to others, um, total number of deaths in the UK from the last five years from MDMA, one. Total number from alcohol in the last five minutes. Um, psychedelics have, and these are big claims, and I wish I'd, I could pull up the evidence to substantiate it, psychedelics have zero addiction potential. You find me one person who's physiologically addicted to psychedelics, and I'll stop giving these talks. Um, psychedelics have no, zero overdose potential. There is no known physiological overdose. Psychological overdose from taking a heroic dose, yes, it's actually called a heroic dose of a psychedelic, is another matter altogether. But, um, and the third statistic I'd like to point out is that there is no statistically significant increase in psychotic switch. So this idea of... Why do I keep bringing up Charlie? Charlie took a tab of acid and was never the same again. He went crazy. Well, Charlie probably was predisposed to developing a psychotic illness, and that's why that happened. It triggered it off. But there's no, there's no evidence that it actually induces any sort of psychotic illnesses. In terms of long-term... Um, sorry, am I talking too much? Good. In terms of, in terms of long-term um, data and long-term effects, we don't have many. And that's often one of the criticisms that is put back on people like me, going, well, you don't know how safe this is in the long term. Well, let us research it. How else are we possibly going to know? Because it's not research, the, the, the pathway of human innovation. Um, so yes, I'd love to answer your question. Talk to me in about 30 years. With any luck, I'll have an answer for you. Uh, thank you, Prash.